Thank you, Kathy. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Anu Rao from the Indotronics Avani Group, and I've been a longtime member of ISM New Jersey. And one of my favorite portfolios is serving on the Supplier Diversity Committee. And that's why it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to this special panel discussion, which will delve into the latest trends in veteran and military spouse supplier diversity. The panel is comprised of practitioners and thought leaders in the space from across the country. So without further delay, I will hand over the virtual mic to John Perez, who some of you might remember was the recipient of the ISM New Jersey Emerging Professional Award a few years back. He will be moderating the discussion. Welcome John and all the panelists. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the, the kind, uh, warm introduction. Uh, thanks to my, my colleagues that are here joining. We've got a pretty great panel, I think, today. Um, appreciate all those that are able to join here this afternoon and those in the future that will be joining and, and listening in on the recording. We hope this will be a, an informative session, a fun session. I know for me, this is, to be honest, it's just an honor to be on such a great looking panel. Look at this. This is hands down the best looking panel that I have moderated, at least today. Yeah, so you're yeah, right. outstanding, really. I'm Nobody else half hour. Right. We'll take it. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, let me uh, start with uh, just, we'll, I'll go around and we could do really quick introductions, share a little about your organization, and then I'll, I'll take back and we'll, we'll jump into some questions. And then we'll, we'll certainly leave plenty of time at the end for questions from the uh, our different attendees. Uh, so I'll go, as I see folks on my screen, uh, Stephanie, would you like to, to kick us off on a quick introduction? Sure, uh, Stephanie Brown, I am a military spouse, a veteran spouse. Um, I also grew up in the military, uh, married into the military and have raised kids in the military. My, I am the CEO and co-founder of the first ever US Military Spouse Chamber of Commerce. I also founded the Rosie Network, gosh, coming up on a decade ago. Uh, and we do really one thing, and that is helping our active duty veterans and military spouses uh, successfully launch and grow businesses all over the country uh, through our training program. And of course, the Military Spouse Chamber of Commerce, uh, which we just launched in January and have over four, we got over 400 members in the first three months. So a lot of military spouse business owners out there. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Congratulations on that great growth. Thanks. Uh, Keith, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you. I'm Keith King. I'm the founder and CEO of the National Veteran Business Development Council. We are the leading certification organization for veteran-owned and service-disabled veteran-owned businesses who want to work with or engage with our corporate members, uh, which I'm proud to say Johnson & Johnson was the corporation of the year uh, last year. Um, and I am a veteran, I'm a Vietnam veteran, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Keith. And Misty. Good afternoon, my name is Misty Sussman Fox. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship and Small Business here at the Institute for Veterans and Military Families. The Institute has been serving military connected individuals since 2007 now and have served over 162,000 to date. So not only do we help start and grow businesses, but we help veterans with their career preparation, with our onward opportunity, get the resources they need with our America Serves. And obviously we also have some great research and data that comes out of our shop. Uh, and I work closely with Johnson Johnson and other corporations with our coalition of veteran owned business. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, John. Thank you so much, Missy. And Francisco to, to bring us home. And Francisco, dual hat, both small business and, and your work at uh, the New Jersey State Chamber. So please, uh, please go next. Thank you, excited to be here. Francisco Cortez, I'm a proud US Army veteran, uh, president and co-founder of the New Jersey State Veterans Chamber of Commerce, uh, and also a small business owner, as John mentioned, I own a marketing firm headquartered here in New Jersey. Happy to be part of the group. Thank you. So let's uh, jump in, what I'll do, and for those uh, uh, participants, if you'd like, please jot notes in or questions in the chat, we'll certainly get to them. We're gonna go through a few different topics and then we'll, we'll open it up to broader questions. But let's start with just an overview of the space, veteran owned businesses, military spouse owned businesses. Missy, I'll ask you to, to kick us off. Tell us a little bit about this, this demographic, you know, how, how many of these businesses exist in the US? What are, what are they doing? And, and then ultimately let's, let's really dive into why should we partner with veteran owned businesses and military spouse owned businesses? So definitely I can dive right into this. So 
I think everyone's always seen the numbers that are always out there about better known businesses just right off the top. There's better known businesses do about 210 million a year. If you look at the 28 million small businesses operating in the US, 10% of those are veteran owned businesses, which are interesting because veterans of working age, it's only one out of 20. So they're wildly overrepresented when it comes to small business. Aside from that, supporting veteran owned businesses is also great business for a variety of reasons. Not only are veteran owned businesses typically more diverse, in most studies that come back, you'll see veteran owned businesses will more than likely up to 60% and higher have another diverse certification that they qualify for. Many, around 32%, have three diverse certifications that they can qualify for. And I think another important thing to point out is you can always look and say, here's how much a veteran-owned business has in payroll. But veteran-owned businesses for payroll are known to pay their employees 20% more than the national average. So I think it's a great stat to look at and say, not only by supporting veterans, are you supporting great communities, but they're also doing well by the folks that work for them. And I think that that's another great thing. You know, veteran owned businesses do face their own challenges. And that's something that there's also several groups that are, you know, lobbying around to help them through those challenges. But overall, veteran owned businesses are, they earn more than their civilian counterparts. They are typically have more success rates after three and five year success rates as well. Top industries will include manufacturing, transportation, a lot of services, consulting, cybersecurity is a big one. But I think that in the terms of the overview, veteran business is big business right now, and it's a very successful business. And there's a lot of groups now that have kind of rallied around the idea of how do we get more of these veteran-owned businesses into supply chains? So that's where you see groups like the Chamber of Commerce that are stepping forward to say, how do we get these companies procurement ready? And how do we do better business with you know, Fortune 500, uh, Fortune 500 companies and these companies. And that's where we stand in with the coalition. And I know some of the chambers that are on here too. But overall, that's what's happening right now in the kind of veteran owned business world. And I think that there's a lot of excitement around how we can, you know, do better and make sure that these companies are procurement ready and are available to take note and be in these supply chains. I will say it's great to see the world opening back up again because I was also looking at you know recent data that we've seen and around 72% of veteran owned businesses cite not only social networks as a challenge to grow their business, but also their number one preferred way to network with corporations and others that they would like to do business with. So I think it's very interesting now that we now have an opportunity to say, Let's get back out there and kind of meet these VOBs and get them into our supply chains. So that's no, that was a, a great overview. And I'm going to turn to uh, the other panelists here in a second to build off this theme of, of why uh, better known businesses. So maybe Keith, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Maybe you know, what are the one or two things that you share with your corporate partners on why partner with a, with a veteran owned business? And then Stephanie, I'll certainly ask you the same on the, on the military spouse side. I think number one is the skill set of the veterans. I think people underestimate uh, not only the training and the value of that training. If you look at it, the training that we collectively receive in the United States military is, is probably the highest levels of training anyone's ever going to receive uh, in any endeavor that they pursue. Uh, I joke about uh, being in Vietnam uh, because of my job. You know, I was all over what was known as the Central Highlands. Well, I'd be in an area that was a jungle. I'd come back a week later and somebody started cleaning it out, what we call an LZ. A month later, we'd have the Navy show up with the CBs and I'd have a city. You know, I mean, come on. And if you look at the ability, and, and, and Misty talked about cybersecurity, we created cybersecurity. If you look at it in the sense of the military, that's where this whole idea came from. So I think the skill set, number one. Number two, it's what I hear constantly from our corporations is the dedication, the thoroughness, the fact that you know veterans are, are highly disciplined in the sense of showing up, showing up on time. You know, the standard joke is, is if you arrive five minutes early, you're late. Um, you know, we see this, we hear this from our corporations. So I think our corporate members who have worked with our certified veteran businesses have been very positive in their feedback. 
They've been happy with the veteran businesses that they have hired and included in supplier diversity. Because again, when we look at the bigger picture, John, you 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 work with me enough, Misty, as well. Because again, even when we look at this, if you look at the history of veteran businesses going back to when we created veteran businesses in the federal statutes back in '99. It wasn't until the NVBDC launched certification in 2014 that was acceptable to the corporations that finally the corporations actually started including veterans formally in their supplier diversity program. So if you look at it in, in the bigger sense, we're still relatively new, but uh, I'm proud to say that and, and I'm as very thankful to the corporations who have uh, not only embraced the certification, but, but more importantly, embraced our veterans. Uh, so, so many great points there, Keith, and I think we'll, we'll certainly uh, return to and revisit some of how, how best to engage and also some of the certification topics. Um, let's, uh, let's finish on the, on the, the YVOB, you know, Francisco, you're, you're a small business owner, so you're giving your um, you know, your, your pitch to prospective clients, I'm sure on a very regular basis. What are some of the things that you typically share for, for why better know businesses? So I think it, it, the point has been alluded here, the work ethic of the veteran is, is unique, right? So I'll give myself as a perfect example. I was stationed in Fort Orr in California. A regular uh, work day for me was 18 hours in the desert fighting uh, missions. So when I left, um, uh, the military and I joined the corporate sector, when they would ask me to work a weekend, I would laugh. I'm like, of course. And, and managers were impressed because they're like, this guy has never complained once. So now transition that into small business ownership. Uh, some of my clients, uh, they have very large scale campaigns and some require a lot of attention, long hours and very high demand for the customer. So my, my work ethic kind of trickles down to my entire team. So when a client is like, can you help me out on a Saturday? The answer is always yes. Or can you get me something by 5 a.m.? The answer is always yes. So those discipline uh, and things that we learned in the military really transfer into business ownership and to our clients. Our clients are always happy. No, that's great. Wonderful points. And Stephanie, I'd love for you to to pick up on, on military spouses and the, what, are, what are the, the values uh, and what's the benefit to partner with those organizations? Yeah, and, and you know, I have been a military spouse and of course, um, you know, this is a very important topic and community for me personally. Uh, to Keith's point that, you know, I think veterans have been, you know, undervalued or, or um, and certainly the military spouse has, I think for many years, my mother was a spouse. She gave up her career to, you know, raise a bunch of us and follow my dad around. He's uh, also a Vietnam veteran. And I think what we've come to realize that, you know, military spouses, actually the unemployment and underemployment challenge that, that impacts military spouses impacts the, our country. <laughs> it impacts mission readiness. It impacts retention. And when a service member transitions out of the military, if they have a spouse that's employed, their success or the way they view their transition, 70% or more say it was a positive transition if their spouse is employed. Sadly, military spouses today continue to have one of the highest, if not the highest unemployment rate. And you know, why does that matter? Well, it costs taxpayers money. I mean, it costs taxpayers anywhere between 700 to over a billion dollars a year in, um, in cost. So the focus for many generations has always been traditional employment. It isn't until just recently that entrepreneurship and self-employment has really come to the forefront. And we are, you know, military spouse, all the, the benefits and the training and resiliency that veterans have I would argue spouses also have that by the very nature of our lifestyle. We hold higher levels of education than our civilian counterparts. Um, we are two times more likely to start a business than our civilian counterparts. I mean, the, we are seeing a rise of spouse-owned businesses of all types. These are not Tupperware 
you know, salespeople of all types across the board and skill sets and expertise that has just been, you know, incredibly, um, in, it, you know, inspiring to me and all of the, you know, military spouses out there. Uh, you know, we're looking at roughly half, 48% of spouses today are either business owners, self-employed, or they want to be business owners and self-employed. And that is, that is significant. Um, and for all the right reasons, working with military spouse-owned businesses, I mean, you're, you are helping a military family, you're helping the military community, and you're helping these, the, the communities themselves and our economy. So I'm excited to be able to bring and create, hopefully, a seat at the table for military spouses. Yeah, no, I just jotting down some notes from the things everyone shared, you know, entrepreneur, and this held true both for the veteran owned businesses and the military spouse owned businesses, entrepreneurial, diverse, broadly based across many industries, well-trained, highly ed educated, resilient, dedicated, thorough. These are all the things we were looking for in organizations we're going to partner with, right? In, in the B2B B2, and, and the B2G world for that matter. Um, so just such a compelling business case why to go and, and engage with these organizations. Let's, um, let's transition to, to a, the next topic. I think this will be one that, that everybody can, can add into, and it's a little bit about the support organizations and ecosystem that's been built both for the veteran-owned business, for the military spouse-owned business, but also for the procurement or supply management or supplier diversity professional to engage with these organizations. So what I'd love is to share a little bit about what your organization does and how it adds value. And I think in particular, you know, knowing our audience is predominantly supply management, supplier diversity and, and procurement professionals, you know, what's in it for those individuals? Why should they engage with, with your organization? What, what benefits do they get? Um, I'll, I'll start with, um, with Keith and I'll turn to, to Stephanie and, and Francisco Missy. So Keith, would you like to kick, kick us off? Sure, thank you. I think it's relevant if we look at the history uh, in, in the sense that my company, I started my first company in 1984. So I've been a entrepreneur for a very long time. And when the law that we created that, well, we wrote it in 97, well, it was finally passed in 99. The federal law 10650 is the law that created veteran businesses as legal entities recognizable entities to do business with the federal government. That's the first really initial starting point of veteran-owned businesses. My company was one of the first to do business with the federal government under those terms. Uh, my company was one of the very first ever verified by the VA. That law was actually passed in 2006, where it challenged and charged the VA with some form of verifying veteran businesses. Took two years to define what that was like. That was launched in 2008. Most people know it as a CVE or the VA dot, uh, vet biz dot dot, a lot of different acronyms. The reality of that became quite prevalent, quite open exposure, if you will, to me as a business person who had spent 14 years doing federal contracting and ran into the situation where frankly, the corporations were not hiring veteran owned businesses. Um, I wanted to know why. I happened to be in Detroit, so I have access to a couple of little companies you probably heard of called Ford and Chrysler and General Motors, you know, GM's two miles down the road. So, you know, it's not a big jump for me to go see GM. But the fact of the matter is, is what they said over and over and repeatedly, every one of them I talked to said, the standards that the VA uses, that the federal government uses, is not the same, it is not equal, it is not acceptable to us in the corporate supplier diversity arena. It's not, and until you veterans create a supplier or a certification program to meet those standards, we're not gonna risk our name, our reputation, our company name, our company reputation. So when we look at the next process, which was, all right, we heard it, what are we gonna do? Um, I was blessed by having one, the, the position, the time, the, the wherewithal to actually set, set my business aside and start 
creating what is now called the National Veteran Business Development Council and the team I had around me. Uh, some of the people on this panel know what I call my partner, Brigadier General Dick Miller, who commanded our troops in Afghanistan. And uh, Dick and I and a couple of other veterans uh, started putting this program together. What happened in, I think again, and the key element of it is in 2014, we took that time to put our program together. We presented it to a group of 14 different organizations, including the SBA, the VA, AT&T, the automotives I mentioned, the women, we bank, the, the national minority, on and on. And they all said, okay, you got it. You know what you're doing, go build it. It will help you. And what I'm proud of is, is the five corporations in that, or in that initial meeting, in fact, lent their name, lent their money, put their on letterhead saying, we now accept this certification for veteran business and we launched. What's happened in that last, in that last seven years has been nothing short of a miracle, nothing short to me uh, of, uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate. The last numbers we have is just to give you a scope of, of what has happened it was from 2019. I still don't have the 2020 numbers yet. I'm trying to get those compiled from the corporate members who have hired the veteran businesses who have been certified by the NBBDC was a little over $2 billion. Well, you know, when you go from zero to 2 billion in six years, five years, uh, that was pretty good. And so when we look at the scope of it, you know, I think Francisco and, and Stephanie and, and even Misty's program, all of this is kind of like mushroom, if you will, since really that time frame, I mean, most of this is relatively new. I know Stephanie for the last, what, eight, 10 years that I've known her. But again, all of this was in the beginning. So it's not like what we, the women have, what, 25, 28 years of certification, minority push, what, 45 years of, of certification. So, you know, it's taken some time, but the reaction again, with the Chamber of Commerce, the reactions with all of the government work, the VBOX, you know, all of the SBA work, all of that has really jumped off from the 1999 law. But again, it's almost all of this is in the mid 2000s. So I think that in the scope of things, and when you look at what the corporations did, and I can't acknowledge them enough. I can't thank them enough because they're the ones who actually have stepped up and included our veterans and supplier diversity. Uh, no, it's a great, uh, I'll, I'll jump in for a second. Yeah. It, it, it's uh, one, thank you for grounding us in the history of, hey, this space is frankly less mature than some other areas of supplier diversity that some of the folks on the call may be more familiar with, um, in particular when it comes to certifications. And I think that for me really stood out as, you know, hey, why should you engage with some of these organizations? Yeah. One, it's around the certification and finding the trusted partners that, that you shared. I think another one is, you know, hey, you do have this pool of sort of trusted suppliers. Yes, they're certified, but hey, that's, that's right. a place to go to to sort of find some, um, uh, to, to fulfill some of your needs and find companies that can do it. I'll, I'll turn, you know, Stephanie, maybe tell me a little bit, you know, what are the services that, that your organization, if you'd like to also talk about the Rosie Network, certainly, what are some of those things that your organization is providing and, and why should that procurement professional uh, potentially engage with, uh, with the chamber? Well, you know, it all for, for me began uh, with Rosie's list. So think Rosie the Riveter, think Angie's list, Craig's list, right? And I, I needed to find a plumber and I didn't want to bring somebody into my home that I didn't know, that I didn't have a sense of, you know, confidence <laughs> in. And so I, I realized that I couldn't find a veteran owned plumbing company on Angie's or Craig's or even on the website. And so that really kind of began this journey. I'm going to create it. And, um, you know, I was fortunate to, I went to VWISE, uh, IBMF's program and really kind of narrowed down, okay, what do I want this to do? What do I want this to look like? And, and I had some great mentors there and rosieslist.org was born in, I think, 2012. Today, today it, although it's being rebuilt right now, today it's the largest free searchable database of veteran and military spouse owned businesses, not certified, not all of them are certified, but we do verify military affiliations. So you can go on there and find a florist 
you know, a landscaper, uh, handcrafted items for military families all across the globe. But what I, I realized there was a, a gap in training so that the Rosie Network kind of stepped in and developed this program called Service to CEO, which we provide in 32 states across the country and overseas. It's free. Um, and through that journey, I realized, wow, our military spouses, despite the DOD spending a lot of time and a lot of money focusing on traditional employment for spouses, we, we continued to miss the mark that, you know, I came to the table and said, we got to think outside the box. These are incredibly, you know, innovative, driven, determined um, women, over 90% of them are women. Uh, and a very diverse population. Uh, so, you know, we have to think outside the box. This, this one size fits all Monday through Friday, nine to five job kind of solution that everybody's painting is not gonna work. Uh, and that, that kind of began this conversation. And really, you know, I had an opportunity to stand up a task force with the um, spouse of the army um, chief of staff. And we said, you know, we need a way to recognize. I knew Keith King. Uh, in fact, he and I had talked about it. And I'm a, a member of the CVOB, which I know Misty will talk about. And, you know, came across and started working with USAA and their supplier diversity and John, you, and said, you know, we, we need we need a way to certify and recognize military spouse-owned businesses out there. We know the number is growing. We know it is needed. So we dove deep and did the, the work. And thanks to, you know, uh, innovators and trendsetters like Keith, um, you know, we, we mapped it out and said what we, what we want to create has got to be industry standard, right? Including on-site visits. Well, right now they're virtual, but, you know, we, I wanted this to be legitimate, to be something that, you know, uh, USAA or Johnson could be proud of and could say we do X amount of business with military spouse owned companies and the benefit to these companies again some of the reasons i mentioned already but again it's military spouses are predominantly yes we're women but we are a very diverse population so um in fact of our members at the military chamber we have just under 50 percent are minority owned and i you know that is significant so you're you're you know you are really embracing, um, you know, you're embracing, you know, an incredibly diverse and um, resourceful community that, that, as I said before, the businesses that we have range from construction companies. Uh, we have one of our certified military spouses who was just featured on military.com. She owns a construction company, right? We have, we have military spouse owned businesses that are doing, you know, millions of dollars in business each year. So um, I'm really excited, especially the companies that have got come on board and said, we recognize that we have to support our spouses because supporting our spouses supports our veterans. It's not one or the other. It's the other side of the same coin. And <clears throat> we want to accept the certification. Um, I think what you know, it was critically important to myself and my co-founder and our team, which includes individuals from Disney, um, you know, and, and Amazon and USA and others and you, John, um, is it, it wasn't enough for us to just certify their business. We wanted to be a liaison, a conduit between that business owner and the corporation, right, to make sure that, as Misty said, they're procurement ready. That, you know, we're not just tossing them off to you, that we're actually working with you and the business to make sure that we are there to provide mentorship or resources should they hit a snag. I mean, our goal is to make sure it's successful because if it's successful, you're going to increase your spend. You're going to want to do more business with military spouses. And so that's, um, you know, that, that's, and we're off to a great start. So it's new. But the idea of the certification and helping spouses is not. <laughs> um, we've been working on this with, you know, talking to Keith, IVMF, uh, USA, and others for quite a number of years. And it is finally here. And um, I couldn't be more excited and honored, really, because these, these spouses are um, truly remarkable. No, it's, inc it's incredible growth and so, so important for this population. Um, I'd like to um, 
to turn to Francisco, if you could share a little bit about the New Jersey Chamber. You know, many of the folks that, uh, that are on now and the on later are from the greater New Jersey area. You know, what are some of the things that you're doing for this population? Again, why, uh, why should procurement professionals and businesses and governments within New Jersey engage with the Chamber? So the Chamber was launched three years ago. And I think many people on here have heard the term network uh, is uh, network is worth your net worth. Basically, we've established some very credible relationships since launch, one of them being yourself, John. So uh, you uh, and I and Jeff were very closely together and we share resources. Just yesterday, you made us aware of this amazing grant program that Johnson & Johnson has launched that benefits veteran business owners. So because of the network that we have access to, which extends to not only private corporations, but state agencies, we're able to pass that on to our members. Um, separately, you know, the state of New Jersey has a law uh, that says 3% of its contracts should go to service disabled veteran owned businesses. So we fight for the veteran businesses to get contracts. So that's one of the many benefits as well. We met with the Department of Treasury in New Jersey and prior to the chamber being launched, a service disabled veteran business was charged $100 to get certified in the state to do contracting with the, uh, with the state. That since has been waived. Uh, another thing we do is called Vet Talks. It's a playoff of vet, uh, TED Talks. So we host uh, bi-weekly virtual settings uh, that talk about uh, procurement, what to say during an interview, matchmaking sessions, or simply networking. Because I think the most valuable thing that one veteran business owner can do is get to know another veteran business owner and extend each other's network. So to, to, to your point, um, the Rosie's list, right? We don't have a, a Rosie list here, but maybe one veteran business owner can say, hey, did you hear that uh, Johnson & Johnson is looking for a marketing firm or a construction firm? And then because we're a trusted agency, we present that to you and then hopefully something else will happen. So I think uh, the many benefits, the main one is our network and uh, our, our allies in the space of government contracting and corporate corporate contracting as well. Oh, I, I mean, I love the, the broad point around the networks. I think it's great for the business owners. It's great for the procurement professionals trying to expand their network, right? And, and building that depth of knowledge on the area. And I, you know, I, I have to really commend you on the advocacy work, right? Why do a lot of organizations work with nonprofit partners, well, it's to extend the advocacy, right? To, together, Absolutely. we can go and make changes. So I, I think the New Jersey State Chamber is an outstanding example of that, of being able to advocate for changes to purchasing and acquisition rules at the agency, you know, the, some of the, the uh, state and bi-state agencies, local governments, state government, um, and, and really doing tremendous things. And that is part of our job as procurement professionals, supplier management professionals and business professionals. It's to influence uh, and improve the legal and regulatory environment that we're in. So I, I, I really uh, commend you on that. Misty, uh, I'll, I'll ask you to, to, to bring us home on, on the great work at uh, Institute for Veterans and Military Families and the Coalition for Veteran Owned Business. And you know, why should procurement professionals uh, engage and join the organizations? Sure, definitely. You know, and you heard it earlier, you know, Stephanie said, IVMF is known for kind of two things, one of which is training. So I have 11 national and international programs that I run throughout the nation that meet veteran and military connected entrepreneurs where they're at on their journey. So we host workshops on 35 bases overseas, as well as across the entire country. That can be ideation, startup, and growth. And something that I mentioned earlier is that the Institute has been running programming since 2007. So we've now seen 80,000 military connected individuals come through our entrepreneurship training, which is great, but that's 14 years of entrepreneurship training. And what we noticed is as our veterans were growing up, so did our programming, our relationships needed to as well. IVMF was a founding partner of the Veterans Job Mission, which was a, well, which is a, a mission to get veterans into corporate America. And they've done just that with, I think, over 700,000 hirings, you know, that they can attribute. And then the, you, we're challenged just to say, let's do the same thing, but now for veteran-owned businesses into supply chains. So we're not a certifying body. If you're coming to me to get a veteran-owned business certified, I'm not your person. What I am, though, is a convener and a person that can then help make that connection. So 
we work on getting veterans ready now or procurement ready. And how do we do that is through our training and our conferences. We then also work with supply chain professionals. And as we all just said it, this is kind of the new frontier in supplier diversity. So this is a bit of the wild west out here. So we then work with the other side to say, this is how you can do good business with veteran owned businesses. Here's how you can access them through us and our partners. And we, you know, as well have the list of lists of 24,000 veteran owned businesses that then corporations can say, I need a t-shirt maker in the tri or taking the tri-state area, I need a benefits auditor in the tri-state area. This is a search we actually did that can, you know, audit my benefits package. And that has to be within these three states. And we help find those folks, but we also make sure that, you know, to Stephanie's point that they're then procurement ready to do business. You know, for us, we work closely with our corporate partners so that they can understand how to institutionalize, you know, veteran owned anything or just veterans into their company culture and the fabric of their company as well. And then, you know, we work on the other side to research and make sure that we're doing best by them and can also help corporations understand what they can be doing for the veteran population as a whole to include veteran owned businesses. So that's the quick overview of the Institute. But if you are a procurement professional and you want to engage with us, it's typically going to be around learning how you can access more veteran owned businesses, how you can do better business with veteran owned businesses. And if you want to hire veterans, we have programs for that as well. You know, it's Okay. No, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, if you don't mind. What I'm part of the, the overview of, of the structure and everything that's going on in the community, I'd like to touch because we haven't said anything about it. You know, I, I can only emphasize this from day one and all those early meetings back in 2012 and talking to the corporations, they said to us point blank, do not get caught up in the small business idea that you're only going to certify small businesses. We, uh, again, I'm talking for Chrysler, Kellogg's, AT&T, we have to have bigger companies. And we, the biggest one I have certified right now is about 1.2 billion, had a couple in the 800, 900 million range with 1,500 employees in five countries. So I do want to make sure that everybody who is on here uh, and especially if they're a supplier diversity professional knows that our certification is one capable of it, which was another issue. But the fact is, is that our certification is national, uh, truly nationwide, but it's also from small to the largest of, of, of the largest veteran owned businesses in this country. And, and I think that that's an important part of the transition because as you and I had talked in, in Francisco, you're, you're spot on in the sense of state by state. I was able to help back in 2005, get the veteran law passed here in the state of Michigan. But the point being is, is that with, and, and John and I have had long conversations with every state having their own definition of certification, even down to cities and counties there, we, we went from nothing to you know, 500 of them <laughs> all over everywhere. And, and, and that's still a, a it's not, I wouldn't say a hindrance, but I would say that it's a stumbling block that we would love to be able to see if we can't ultimately come to some decision uh, corporate wise and corporate support and actually what certification means and the methodology and the standards that are acceptable to the corporations. And I, to me, that would be the long-term goal of what we're doing. No, it's a great, yeah. So I, I think a great point, Keith, one to anchor us all in the breadth of the businesses that we're referring to by industry um, and then also by size to your point and expertise to Misty's point, right? That's a, that was a very specific example of the Tri-State example, uh, Tri-State area, mm -hmm. uh, the New York Tri-State area, but I, a very important one to, to show that breadth of different industries, functional focus areas, and then Keith, to your point, size, that it, we're not just referring to a two one person company, we might be referring to thousands uh, of employees at, at an organization. So I, I think a great point on the breadth. And then Missy, thank you also, again, as we were going through, you know, what are the benefits? Why should you partner with these organizations? Some of that, that Missy really touched on, it's that training that, that's being brought, not to, just to the business, but to the procurement community. And then like, augmenting your sourcing was a huge, <laughs> I think takeaway from what Misty shared. I think Misty wants lots of emails from everybody who's on here, a procurement professional saying, I'm looking for a potential supplier that can do X. 
Um, and I say that a little bit jokingly, I'm, but maybe the emails on, all don't go to Missy, but the point that these all of your organizations are capable of supporting that sourcing search, finding suppliers that can augment your, your, your category strategies or be part of your category strategies. And I think it was such an important point that you missed um, Let's, we've, we've got, you know, we're on the, the back half here. I think we've got about 10 minutes left. Please, uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We'll get to them. Um, and I, I do see people are using the chat and we've got a great testimonial there on, on for the Rosie Network. It does not get better to talk about how great these organizations are than when you're hearing um, the Rosie Network changed my life. Does, does not get better than that. Um, so that's that's wonderful. So, so please put your, your questions in the chat. Uh, let's, we've gone through a number of different things. I'm gonna change uh, uh, our direction a little bit and build off of Keith's comment around certifications. What I'd like to go through is maybe if I can ask each of you to, to share, you know, what do you think is maybe the one challenge that veteran-owned business or military-owned businesses have and how could that be addressed by, potentially addressed by the procurement folks on the room? Keith, you mentioned certifications to start, but we'd yeah. love to go around and, and let's talk about some of the challenges that, that might be faced there. As we, we've talked about so many of the benefits and strengths, but uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about challenges. I'll, does anybody want to kick off? I'll, I'll leave it open ended. Stephanie, you put your hand right up there. Yes. <laughs> you need away, Quick draw. That's right. Quick draw, McGraw. Um, no, that's a great. So we, you know, in one of the things that has definitely in uh, um, in the last five years, getting data, getting access to data around. You know, we've had data for quite some time around veteran-owned businesses. There is very little data around military spouse-owned businesses. And just within the last couple of years, we've actually gotten data. So Rosie, the Rosie Network did, uh, you know, the survey that I mentioned earlier, um, uh, mil uh, the military families lifestyle, or I'm, I know I said that wrong. <laughs> Misty will correct me. Survey it told us how many military spouses were turning to this space. Um, and then we just did an early trend report at the mill spouse chamber and, and uh, you know, that gave us even more data, right? And one of the things that we asked were, what are the challenges that you're facing, right? These surveys ask. And for us, for the chamber, it's, it's being wrecked, the, the spouse owned businesses that go through this rigorous certification process, it's being recognized. Give us the opportunity, um, those business development opportunities, access to companies that say, hey, military spouses are 14% of them also served in uniform, by the way. Um, you know, there, let's start looking at that. Let's, let's, you know, see if there aren't some military spouse owned businesses. And again, we're talking, some of them are significant companies doing, you know, um, we have one that's doing $80 million a year in revenue. So, you know, uh, and as we grow our membership, again, we just launched in January. But it's it's really that opportunity. Talk to us, um, um, and and if I don't, if we don't have something in Rosie's lit, I mean in uh, the chamber, then you know we can certainly go to you know Misty or MVBDC <clears throat> or Rosie's list and look through the database um, and talk and share that as well. You know, so it's, we we three we know each other, so <laughs> um, we you know we're here to help each other out because at the end of the day we want to make life better and improve. Uh, business opportunities for this community. That is our goal. But yeah, this, just opportunities, giving giving spouses a seat at the table, recognizing, you know, um, what they bring and and providing, you know, a serious That's opportunity. Great. Yeah. That's a great one. Thoughts from, from the other panels? What are some of the cha biggest challenges you see from some of your, your veteran-owned business or mill spouse or businesses? So I think I one important jump? thing that um, Stephanie kind of talked about earlier is data. So we are data lovers here at the Institute. It is one of the things that gets us up every morning. Um, and I think that Stephanie brought up the good point too around, we take requests. So, you know, much like a dueling piano bar, if you want a piece of data, we often will take requests. And Stephanie did just that. We built a whole line of questions into our national survey, military affiliated entrepreneurs, which According to that survey, there are three top challenges for veteran business owners, and it is largest data set available for uh, veteran small business owners. Um, the three top challenges uh, typically center around capital readiness, which surprises no one. Um, social networks as well, meaning just who they know and how they can make those connections. So I think the seat at the table conversation is extremely important. There are some nuances to that. Uh, veteran owned businesses at a higher 
um, level than their civilian counterparts also have a uh, bias against portals. So that's back to wanting to meet someone per face to face and in person and then, you know, getting bought in on a portal idea. But veterans typically at a much higher rate than their civilian counterparts don't love the whole portal idea, which is fun. Um, and then, you know, of course, mentoring as well. So how do you establish mentorship? And that can be both a formal mentor protege, but also just generally mentorship with folks so that you can grow your business. Um, you know, we've, you know, and you all have seen it too, when it comes to then being able to be recognized and understanding where to go, you know, there, there is a, the alignment around certification as well. And so I think that anything that we can do as a group to kind of grease the skids to say, as a veteran owned business, this is where you need to be. And this is how we can then best position you to be in front of the people you need to be when you're ready and procurement ready, I think is important. Here are the credentials that you need to have, and this is what they do for you. So I think that that's also important when it comes to these challenges. And at the end of the day, I will say this, you know, those are some of the challenges. What can corporations do? 40% of veteran owned businesses said that during the COVID-19 pandemic, while their military skills did get them ready for that, they didn't feel supported by their communities. Um, but at a much higher rate, 70% of veteran owned businesses say that they are responsible for their communities and it's actually one of the leading factors for them to start their business, which doesn't even rank on the civilian side. And so I think it's a huge thing to say, look, you know, look far and wide for those to get into your supply chain, but also your volunteer hours and everything else like that. Look for reasons to engage with veteran business owners, because if you can do it in your backyard, then you're going to grow up the companies that are continuing their service through going their business on those main streets. So I think that that's an important point to make as well. Back over literally, to y'all. Literally doing, doing well by, by doing good. Bingo. Exactly that. No, Francisco, please. So one of the things um, that veterans go through, so we're stationed every three years in a different home in a different state. Oftentimes we can't buy homes. So we end up leaving the military with no collateral. So after 15, 20 years of service, the veteran would like to start a business. How do they, how do they present themselves with no collateral? And oftentimes because they're shipped from duty station to duty station, they also lack credit. Their credit scores are low. So you're not presentable as a veteran. Uh, when I worked in corporate America, uh, I asked a question, me being a veteran, why don't you guys hire more veterans? And I was told veterans are problems. They come out of the military and they are not well. And I urge everyone on this room who is a procurement officer who has an opportunity for a veteran not to listen to that. Veterans are resilient. Veterans are dependable. Veterans work more than any other person out there. Take a chance on a veteran. Uh, oftentimes, because they're shipped from place to place and they launch a business, they lack past performance. Take a shot on a veteran or a veteran spouse. Give them a shot, you would be surprised. So my point is they lack resources, credit, because they move around from place to place and they lack the big access to capital. Uh, that's one of the biggest things that I feel veteran uh, businesses face nowadays. Then what I, what I would like to comment on in the sense of the, the issue that we see frequently with the veterans, it, kind of what Misty was talking about with some resistance to portals. We ask in the certification world quite a bit of personal information, such as your taxes, you know, obviously your DD-214 and the whole idea of operational control and authority, as we talk to fellow veterans, it's not enough to own the company, you gotta actually show up and run it. And we have a lot of resistance to that. And again, part of that resistance is one, because we're relatively still new in the marketplace, but more importantly, we really had a, a, a crisis of confidence that if they gave us all this information that the corporations were really gonna hire veteran businesses in the first place. It's one of the things that, uh, again, in, in the scope of the industry, the first four to five years that we were out doing this certification, I heard over and over again, well, you know, what do you want, Keith? We hired 100,000 veterans. Oh, we're hiring all these veterans as employees. I mean, I couldn't tell you how many times I heard that. And like we said, stop. 
We're not talking about you hiring veterans. Thank you for hiring veterans. We love you for it. We're talking about hiring veteran owned businesses as a part of your supply chain. And that's taken uh, quite a bit of not only work and energy and effort. And, and again, Stephanie has been doing it in, in, in a lot of different ways with us. But the point still is, is, is that we still see that resistance from the veterans. It is companies like your, yours and the other companies that we are working with who say, yeah, we're serious about hiring veteran businesses. And that's helping this transition. We really believe that the longer we're in, the more that we can report the success, the better this will come and it will be least resistance moving forward. So, and I, I would yeah, say one really quickly, one, one of the challenges that we faced when we, when we said, hey, we, wanna, we want there to be a certification for military spouse-owned businesses, I got the, well, why don't they just get certified uh, as woman-owned? Yeah. Um, well, A, they're not all women um, and, and they still can. They certainly can. Um, and they're, uh, you know, a lot of them uh, can go and get other certifications as well, including, you know, veteran owned, because as I said, 14 percent or around that number actually served uh, in uniform. But, you know, look at the for instance, the primary women's uh, agency that certifies women owned businesses has 11 million women owned businesses in their database. Um, spouses don't need to be buried <laughs> in 11 million members, uh, you know, so yes, they can get certified as women, uh, woman owned, minority owned, veteran owned, but recognizing the fact that they have also served and sacrificed and certainly in the career income, buying homes, having a, you know, that uh, the same as the veteran, that it was important that we honor and recognize their unique contribution and challenges. So one, I one, appreciate it. No, go ahead, Francisco, I think. No, one quick thing I'd like to stress on the topic of certification. So my company is certified as service disabled veteran owned. And wow. half of our membership yeah. shies away from memberships. I mean, from mm -hmm. certifications because it's very lengthy and the other half like it. My first three contracts with the federal government were uh, services table set asides. So I urge people to really take the time to do it because it pays off. When I first launched my company, I was going against other marketing companies that had four times the budgets, four times the manpowers to prepare proposals and four times the resources. One thing that they could not go after was service disabled veteran opportunities. So it didn't matter how large their team was, I still had an advantage. So it gives you a very big advantage as a veteran business owner. So I highly urge folks listening today to get certified. Oh, completely. And I think it's important for all the procurement professionals to understand. I, I think you, we sort of touched the tip of the iceberg a little bit on the, there's very different procurement processes between government agencies, private sector. Mm -hmm. Navigating that can be extremely complex, time consuming. You know, we didn't talk about that as one of the key major challenges. And thank you, Misty, for grounding us in the data that, that we, that's come out of the, the most recent uh, research on that. But it is a challenge that they face. And, and simplifying that as best as possible from, for a procurement professional is simplifying your process incredibly important, right? It can't just be, we'll go to the portal, as, as Misty said, right? They don't want to go do that, this population in particular. And as the world talks more about equitable behaviors and practices, right? You have to think about what are the differences and how do different groups react to the processes that we put in place such that we don't inadvertently create barriers. Um, we're, we're down to the last few minutes. So I'm, I'm gonna have to, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just transition. I'm gonna give everybody maybe 60 seconds. If there was just one thing that you wanted to share with procurement professionals, what would be that one takeaway? So I'm gonna end with that. But again, I, I, before I, I transition there, I, I just want to, to, to ground on some of those challenges because I think there's a few things for those supply managers to take away. Misty shared the number one thing, and, and I think everybody brought this access to capital and capital readiness. Well, for a procurement professional, what does that translate? It translates very directly into payment terms, supplier, receivable financing, right? Those are, are differential things that you can do that make a very targeted impact to this population, it makes an impact to other small businesses as well. But for this one, right, the, the number one thing we heard, what's the number one challenge is around capital readiness uh, in particular. What's the, what is your lever as a procurement professional? It's, it's really payment terms, it's, it's uh, supplier receivable financing and, and things like that. So 
I think that was an important takeaway. The other one that I, I, I wanted to call out that I heard from, from our panelists, we talked a bunch about the certifications and recognition of that. Um, and, and also that as part of just understand this population. So make sure you understand the population and you're recognizing these, these different certs and encouraging your businesses that may not yet be certified to go and, and pursue that. Those were the two things I wanted to summarize that. So with our last, we're down to five minutes. We've got four panelists. So it's 60 seconds each. We'll be right, right there at time. Uh, let's go around. What's the one thing that you would like a, a procurement professional who may be on this call to, to take away and know about engaging with this population? I'll, I'll go, uh, who, who would like to kick us off? Missy, go ahead, please. I think you just said it. So I'm gonna restate it in a different way. I think be as entrepreneurial as you're asking the small businesses that you're doing business with to be. And what I mean by that is what John just said, look for ways in your business. Payment terms is a big one. We saw a challenge from a lot of corporations to do it, to change the way you do business. But also like we tell all entrepreneurs, leverage your network, leverage the people that are on these webinars to help it, to make it easier on you to get connected to this amazing group because they will do big time and great business with you. Francisco, please. So I, I often, I've heard the phrase when speaking to corporations or state agencies, I can't find a veteran business to do that job. And I challenge everyone on this call between the five people here, I can guarantee you that we can find you a veteran business to fulfill any contract that you have at any different department. So I urge everyone listening to please reach out to any of our organizations collectively and help us get veteran contracts. Well, I, I can pick up on that really quickly. I, I, anybody who says that to me, I laugh because that's like the old song, looking for love in all the wrong places. If you're looking for a veteran and certified or not, come and talk to me. I mean, my, our reach is roughly, you know, John, because we've done it with you and for you. I've got 35,000 veteran owned businesses in, in my email database. I've got 400,000 veterans in my social media. I mean, we can find whoever you're looking for if they exist. And again, the one wrap up for me is the other side of this conversation we have not touched on, which is the misrepresentation issue. And I'm not gonna belabor that point today, but I think that is one of the reasons we created the NVVDC. I spent 14 years in the federal marketplace. I helped write those laws. So I know it intimately. And I think it's important that at some other later date, we have that conversation as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I, in the last few uh, moments that we have, I would say consider consider building out or developing a, an internal mentoring or support network within your organization that can help um, you know mentor or be a sounding board uh, for veteran and military spouse owned businesses that you're considering working with or are working with. I know that Johnson and Johnson has done it, so. Um, I highly encourage you to look into doing that as well for your for your organization. Great. Again, uh, thank you uh, to the panelists. Wonderful discussion. Hope it was uh, informative for everybody. I'll turn to uh, to a new here for the last uh, few seconds left. Wow! Just wow! I knew this discussion is going to be good. I did not realize how good. Hands down, uh, Kathy and I were texting back and forth throughout the panel discussion saying, oh my God, this is superb. We learned so much. I And I attend a lot of panel discussions uh, and uh, I know that this is one of the best I've attended. I am so excited that Kathy has recorded this and she is going to be sharing it. And I hope, I know I'm going to listen to it again because I just want to make sure I've taken away everything that all of you have said. And um, I, I sincerely hope it uh, goes on to everyone in the ISM New Jersey chapter. Um, and um, I will say this, Stephanie, for starters, I'm going to uh, go to Rosie Network the next time I need something. 
that's going to be a start. <laughs> so thank you so much, each and every one of you. Uh, and I sincerely hope that you will visit us again, uh, either on Zoom or in person. We, uh, ISM Agency does host a bunch of events in this space, in supply diversity. But I realize we haven't done enough in this space, and I'd love for that to happen. Um, and thank you also to all the attendees, and I look forward to the recording. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Take care.